It is a journey of policies, conversations, opinions, and ruminating on ideas that can move the nation forward. With Tinubu, who has consistently declared himself as a Democrat, it is the responsibility of Nigerians to constantly hold their president accountable on the nation's affairs. We are constructively weighing President Tinubu's policies on internal issues of governance to external and bilateral issues, like the current position of ECOWAS on the Jerry Public School Deter, which Tinubu chairs. It is going to be a no holds barred conversation today on the show, as shown Okim Baloyi hosts a former presidential candidate and publisher, Chief Dele Momodu, on these issues. The 60% of Us series. Governance is never a one man's job. The result of good governance is usually a product of concerted effort and the willingness of the political class to deliver value to the governed. Welcome to the MyCon podcast. I'm Shunwa Kimale and I will be piloting this show, which promises to be very engaging because of my guest tonight. This podcast focuses on issues affecting all Nigerians, but pay special and careful attention to how the issues raised affect young Nigerians wherever they are in the world. This is one way to make sure that the conversation never stops. After my every weekday show of politics today and Sunday politics on channels television, this is one way to further engage those who may have been left out or just to make the conversation more robust. For many Nigerians, especially those who have uh, followed political development since independence, democracy has come to stay despite its inadequacies and imperfections. Nigeria is one of the most internally diverse, uh, diverse and plural states in Africa, with over 200 million people from over 300 ethnic groups and languages. There is beauty in diversity and so much strength in numbers. There are also many challenges in our nation today. So when Nigerians were divided along many lines as a result of the 2023 elections, one could say it is one of the features of a largely diverse country like ours. See being contested in the court for the 2023 election produced President Bola Tinubu. The president may not be everyone's favorite, but he's got a country to run and some tough decisions to make. So tonight, we will be talking about those decisions and policies, while also weighing in on some of the issues that have trailed the 2023 elections. Tonight, I have joining me one man who has not held back in sharing his uh, views and also learning himself as a tool for democratic development and progress in this country. He's not only been on the sideline as a journalist, He's also come into the fray as a presidential candidate. In fact, in the last election, he helped the PDP presidential candidate to direct the media, publicity, and uh, the strategic and uh, um, affairs of the of the PDP and Mr. Atiku Abubakar tonight. I'm being joined by Chief Dele Mamadou, a very popular, uh, I wouldn't call him Nigerian because he's also very popular in some other African countries. And around the world. Chief Dele Mamadou is a publisher and he joins us uh, on this podcast. Thank you so much, Chief Mamadou, for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sheung Okimba uh, Thank you for inviting me on your podcast and I hope we will have a very interesting and robust conversation tonight. Absolutely. Uh, your experience uh, for, before the military, I mean, before Nigeria returned to democracy. I know I've had several conversations with you about the role you played um, in the pro-democracy struggle, uh, some of the role you play as someone who was very close to MK Abiola when uh, you were very close to uh, Chief Ghani Fawaini, you, uh, you contested to be a president uh, sometimes in this country, and you have not also kept quiet in uh, lending your voice into public affairs and the affairs of this country. And so tonight, 
I will be engaging you in so many issues. But let me begin uh, because of your role in the 2023 election. The case is in court, however. Uh, president Bola Tinubu was declared president. But so far, from what you have seen uh, at the presidential elections tribunal, what are your views generally? The engagement of Nigerians, the comportment of the political class, and the judiciary? Well, let me start by saying that I'm happy that we're not in a state of war or anarchy. I'm very happy that our leaders in opposition have comported themselves very well by making sure that they have obeyed the rule of law. Uh, those who don't agree that Ashiwa Dibola met in who won the election fair and square, they've gone to court. And that's the right thing to do. And those of us who are their supporters, uh, we wish them well in the deed to uh, recovering their mandates. It's up to the judiciary to do justice to that, whether it's my principal, Alaji Atiku Abubakar, or his former governor, Peter Obi. Uh, so I will be very, very willing to stay till the end of the cases, I'm sure, at the Supreme Court, and then we will know the way forward. But like I said, the most important thing is for politicians to conduct themselves properly and obey the rule of law. I know there's been a lot of uh, monitoring, if that is perhaps a word to use, for those who are supporting either of the, I mean, uh, any of the political parties in, in this. But the judiciary has also been put in, in a very tight uh, situation. If I were uh, in the shoes of any of the five uh, judges that is uh, on the bench in this matter, I don't know, I probably would be under pressure too. Uh, but, but do you think rightly or wrongly that the judiciary has been uh, been pushed in the, in the right place or the wrong place? What What's your view on it? Well, I believe that for the first time, uh, Nigerians are very interested in what the judiciary will do. Uh, I believe, I mean, this is my personal opinion, that majority of Nigerians and even friends of Nigeria and international monitors believe that the election was less than average. No election is ever perfect. But what we expect is that elections must be transparently conducted enough. And this was not the case in the last election. That is my opinion, that it was not transparent enough. You see, we have this attitude in Nigeria of let's move on. Oh, let's just move on. And that is why elections will continue to be rigged and election leaders will become more brazen because they know that at, the every, at every point and at the end of every election cycle, people are going to come up with, let's move on. There is no nation that has made it in the world that made it by just moving on casually. You know, like we are uninterested, we are not bothered, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not a matter of life and death. Oh, he's your friend. Oh, he's a Yoruba man. He's a full animal. You must support this. You, must, you know, we were too casual in our attitude to very serious issues of state. Nigeria is in this sorry state because of that attitude of being casual, of moving on, of explaining everything in terms of ethnicity, of religion, of friendship. It's more convenient for me today to jump in jump in the fray and say, yes, let me just declare myself a supporter of Atiwaju shamelessly, forgetting that a few months ago I was saying that Atiku was this and that. You see, that is why Nigeria is in trouble. So a few patriots must rise up above that pettiness of friendship by putting their country above their personal comfort. Comfort cannot be everything. And the reason why it is so is because a lot of our political leaders, they have no verifiable source or sources of income. Most polit politicians in Nigeria are career politicians. If you ask a man and he says, you say, what do you do? And he says, I'm a politician. Then you know the person is jobless. 
He has nowhere to return to when politics is, is no longer lucrative. And that's why a lot of politicians, even after they've been in power for so long, they still want to remain in power. You are a governor today, you become minister tomorrow, you become senator day after, because the state must continue to provide for them. So I am hoping that the judiciary will do justice and must be seen to have done justice. No matter what happens, of course, everybody will not agree, whatever the judgment, but there is what we call reasonable standard of justice. That is what Nigerians are expecting at this time. With what we have seen in, the, in Nigeria in the past months and years, do you trust the judiciary to do justice? If we didn't trust the judiciary, we won't go to court. When court, because we expect the judiciary to do their best by making sure that justice is upheld in our country, Nigeria. If they fail, uh, they will fail spectacularly. They will fail their family. They will fail themselves. They will fail their country. They will fail the continent of Africa because it means that we will be back to the jungle. So the state of Nigeria today, everybody is talking about it. As you know, I travel everywhere around the world, and nobody is pleased with the fact that we cannot conduct a simple election. An election, especially the presidential one, in which on the same day you had the presidential election and you had the National Assembly election, and in one, everything went smoothly. In another, in the same election, same time, same place, everything started going haywire. That, for me, is very unfortunate. After spending about a budget of about 400 billion, we wasted a budget of 400 billion. After the reassurances of our reassurances from Mahmoud Yakubu, I mean, it, it's just so sad. Do you know how much Nigeria could have? What Nigeria could have done with 400 billion? There is no point wasting all that resources if we knew we will not be serious. If we knew that we were not going to conduct a proper election and it was a charade and we just wasted people's time. But, but there are those who will say, uh, Chief Dele Mamodo, I mean, and, and, I, and I like, I like to ask you, do you think that there is any sense of credibility or fairness in that election? No, I don't. For the presidential, it was a very hopeless case. You see, my knowledge of Nigerian history, I'm a good student of Nigerian history. My knowledge of Nigerian history is very simple. In 1979 and 1983, we held similar elections. Very, very similar. Jehovah Fenaulo ran from the southwest. The winner of Odisha, Dr. Nandi Azikwe, ran from the southwest. The Malaman, Aminu Kano, was a major force, just like Rabbi Kwakwaso now, in Kano. Alayaji Shehu Shagari was the major force from the Northwest. So it was very similar. My knowledge of Nigeria and looking at the case of Buhari in particular, Buhari started running for election in 2003. Buhari could not win. Why? He controlled the entire northern region. He was a major force in the northern region. But because he could not cross into the south, he didn't win election on three occasions until the fourth attempt when he was able to build bridges across. So for me, and I've told you this on your channel's program before, that for any president to be credible, you must hold your base very well. That is, if you are a southern candidate, you must win in the southwest, win majorly in the southeast, and also in the south-south then you cannot attempt to cross to the other side and win a few regions. So you must lock down four regions very, very well. But those regions must include your own region. I hope you are following me. Absolutely. So in a yeah. situation where a man is not strong in the southeast, is not strong in the south-south, he barely managed in his own base, something is wrong. So... But, like I said, the case is in court. That is my view. So, I will allow the judges to unravel what happened to that election. And why Yakubu was so in so much a mad rush, 
that he had to declare a winner when there were protestations in play. Why couldn't you just hold on for two, three days so you can then give legitimacy to that election? I have nothing against any candidate. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a Democrat. Mm -hmm. In 2019, I supported Atiku and uh, Peter Obi in 2019. You understand? Yet, I was the first to advise Alagi Atiku Abubakar that you congratulate Buhari because the election was reasonable enough. It was not perfect. It was far from perfect, but it was reasonable. This one was not sensible at all to me. It didn't, I mean, the, the mad rush, declaring a winner in the middle of the night, and see there is something you are running away from. You know, if I places a burden on whoever is declared winner, and that is the burden of legitimacy that we are facing right now, I'll be very happy if Tinubu is declared winner of the presidential result without all these controversies. But in a situation where you, are, you have to declare a candidate in the middle of the night, you are rushing, Dino Melaye stood up while the election thing was going on and raised objections. They did not give him a chance. The only thing is go to court. Because those who said go to court, they know that it becomes very tedious, very expensive, outlandishly expensive to go to, through a court process. Do you know how many billions will be wasted by Peter Obi, by Alaji Atiku Abubakar in court. This we could have been saved of if Yakubu was ready to listen, was ready to take a pause and say, okay, let's wait two, three, four days. Even if you are going to pretend, pretend. In life, you cannot just tell people to go to hell, go to places, go to court, and expect that there won't be repercussions. It is wrong. So you blame so, you, you blame the INEC chairman. I blame him absolutely. Mm. So uh, I blame him. He you, was not he was, he was not cautious at all. Mm. If you if what he did was reckless by not listening to those who complain why the election thing was done. That's what we are against. If, it is not about who won or who did not win. Mm. I don't care. I am a Democrat. I know in an election only one man can win. And I know that it was very possible for Asiwaju to have won that election. But it should be seen to have won without all these unnecessary controversies. But if, if you say the election wasn't uh, free and fair, how then do, would you describe the fact that a Peter Obi, who is not a PDP member, a PDP uh, candidate, a PDP, a political party that has held sway for so long, a lot of people will say that if the election was going to be between any or among any of these candidates, it will be between largely the ruling party and the PDP, for example. But with the manner in which Peter Obi came uh, into the fray, a lot of people thought that uh, it might cause some upset. Uh, Peter Obi, for example, defeating Bola Tinobu in Lagos. Do you think if the election were not free and fair, and this is the argument in some quarters and the school of thought of some people who hold the view that maybe there is a sense of fairness in the game uh, that could have led to a Peter Obi picking some states in Nigeria up to about 11 states or so. Don't you think? Jim, I don't know. In my days at the university, I read a book about the Art Food Dodger. I can't remember the author now. So you can Google it later, the Art Food Dodger. Anybody who wants to compromise an election will not be so stupid as to make it obvious that I have compromised the election. If you want to rig election, you will get expert riggers, you will get mathematicians, statisticians, you will get all kinds of people. You will even have psychologists who will give you the psychology of election, apart from the anatomy of it. And the one the psychology of it is to give a semblance of Oh, it is free and fair. Maybe I lost Lagos. What was the margin of loss in Lagos? There are people who believe, and it's one of the things Peter Obi is contesting, that he recorded more votes in Lagos than was awarded to him. That is his belief. And a lot of people believe it. A lot of people believe that there were areas where articles called much more votes and they were deliberately watered down. So, I'm not fooled. If anybody wants to rig, 
they are going to rig with experts very close by. I don't have any evidence of how it was done. But that alibi, you are trying to give a cast iron alibi by saying that if he wanted to read, then he would have quickly go. No, you won't read right, it's obvious. And then it was even so difficult to have read Lagos <laughs> with the firepower of those young people who came out in Lagos. It was almost impossible. So what did they have to give them when they called by Jensen Legal? Let's just give it to them. Lagos was too hard. You, you read where you have overwhelming presence. That was not the case in this last election. I can tell you, I voted in Lagos and I saw people and this is not about Ipo or no Ipo. It's about the generality of young, distributioned, frustrated, and hopeful Nigerians who felt for the first time that their votes will count and we will count. And they were disappointed. It would be difficult to persuade an average Nigerian that votes would ever count in Nigeria. It's so unfortunate because Yakubu went on and on reassuring the nation on television, even on your programs. Was that what happened? Mm. Would you expect that somebody will weigh about 400 billion on an election and that election would not be near perfect? Not even 55% perfect. Below average. That is the problem. It has nothing to do with who won or who did not win. Nobody is my enemy. You know very well how close I am to Abba Ashwaju. Despite the fact that we're not in the same political party, if he won, and even that election was just 52, 54, 55% accurate, nobody will complain. But this one was a disgrace to Nigeria. International disgrace. Everywhere you go, people are talking about it. Even cool plotters in Nigeria, they are teasing us. They are taunting us. They are you that know to even hold on early election. You are attacking cool plotters. That was the difference between cool plotting and election rigging. It's a shame on all of us. And it cannot be defended. So the last hope of the people is the judiciary. So if the judiciary can come up and explain so many things for us, because there are so many things before them, from two major participants, Alaji Atiku Abubakar and former Governor Peter Obi, if they can come and come up with reasonable, not technical, because the tradition is to bring you, I mean, we have so many technical governors in Nigeria, and they will just come. Somebody who did not contest election, they will say due to A and D and whatever, then you, they declare you governor. That cannot continue. And you see, it, it, it's pushing our young ones towards disaster, towards taking desperate decisions. It's unfair because Nigeria has been very kind to most of these politicians. And I'm very proud, like I said, that the two major actors have decided to go to court instead of causing mayhem in Nigeria because it's innocent children they, that will get killed. Let me, let me, let me quickly, if, if there's one lesson, you have participated in several presidential elections. Uh, you have also, in fact, uh, a close ally to other presidents outside of Nigeria. So you have a mismatch of experience when it comes to presidential election. If there's one major lesson that you're taking away from 2023 election, what would that be? Uh, it's that it, it doesn't seem Nigerian politicians are ready for democracy. It's like we're moving towards autocracy, we're moving towards um, dictatorship, we're moving towards monarchy, if possible. If you get to a stage where Nigerians are going to agree generally that there's no point wasting money on conducting elections, why don't we just do a selection process? It's, it's looking like that now. Hmm. I mean, if you have your way as a daily Mamadou, would you think of being a president of Nigeria, maybe in 2027? No. I remember telling Governor Aminu Waziri Tambua the other day, I said, oh God, I'm sorry, I can never contest again in Nigeria unless my party decides to adopt me. And that's the level of frustration in the land. It's virtually impossible. 
there are too many big forces at play. Those forces are not easy. Forces of money, forces of politics, forces of religion, forces of ethnicity, all kinds, even international people who are interested, you know, there are international parties. You have the British, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, all sorts. They are interested because, you see, Nigeria is a land overflowing with milk and honey. And the real owners of the milk and honey have nothing to eat, only a few people. And then they throw the crumbs and the rest of us, and we all jump up like yo-yo. That's why you see people doing Thanksgiving when they give them inferior appointment. Most people cannot survive now outside power. So people must be in government. You see people paying to remain in government. You see people over blessed by God. They have everything, but they need power. If they don't need power for more wealth, they need power for protection. So EFCC will not come and challenge them, come and harass them. You can see some of the governors who left a few days ago or <laughs> two months ago, they are already being harassed. So they need that protection by being in government. That is why a lot of them don't really need money again. <laughs> and you know some of the people I'm talking about, they don't need money, but they need government protection. Hmm. I mean, for someone like Elijah Atiku Abubakar, uh, he's uh, over, over 70 now, uh, do you think if everything doesn't work well now, do you think you will ever, I mean, just like I was asking you, do you think Elijah Atiku, this could be Elijah Atiku's, uh, Atiku's final try at being a president? Uh, it could be anybody's final time, even uh, Tinubu, who was declared president. It's so, uh, they, they, I'm sure they are in the same category if you want to answer that question. Uh, but I can't answer for them. It's their personal decision. After all, Joe Biden in America is planning to come back if his party gives him the ticket. So he will be in his 80s by the time he will be in second term. So nothing is impossible in politics. Uh, Tiku Abubakar is very healthy to the best of my knowledge. I worked very closely with him in the last almost uh, one year. And so I can say that he's very strong. If so if he gets power, he may want to do second term. If he doesn't get it, he may want to try again. He, what I love about him is that he's not desperate. He is exercising his fundamental human rights by contesting election, and he has not forced anybody to support him, and he has not caused me him. He has not recruited any thugs to work for him. All the people I see around at Tiku Abubakar are intellectuals, young people from different parts of Nigeria and the world. I mean, I love, I mean, until I joined his campaign, I, I mean, I knew he was a very technical, very professional, very cosmopolitan gentleman, but I was able to witness firsthand that this is one great Nigerian statesman who wants to do things appropriately. Most politicians, if you ask what is their business, it will be difficult for you to tell. But with Atiku, he has visible and verifiable means of income. He's one of the largest employers of labor in Nigeria, and people love and respect him for, for that. He's been able to build bridges across Nigeria. Don't forget that in 1990, as far back as 1993, he was able to step down for Chief Motu Dabiola in just. He moved on without causing any problem in the party. Any other person would have caused so much mayhem. He had the capacity. But this is a man who, right from the time he was a teenager, he's been a businessman. He was able to build a house for his mother after his father died even before he was 18. That is him. And he has maintained that business acumen. God has blessed him so much. His children are very well educated so they can survive without government. And go and see his fingers in so many parts. When people talk about you know, politicians sometimes, I mean, I wonder how he manages it that he doesn't even bother. Anything they say, all that God has done for him is to continue to bless him more. Hmm. So, I mean, why... As it look like um, the rest of those who are behind Atiku Abubakar have uh, departed, and it looks like the rest of the world has moved on. I don't think so. I have not departed. You know that for a fact that I have not departed. I have been talking consistently, and I'm supporting him wholeheartedly. It's not by force. 
Of course, some people, it's the nature of elections in Nigeria, a country where a man can wake up in APC, have lunch in PDP, and by evening is in Labour Party. It's allowed in Nigeria. It's not like that in Ghana. But my personal principle is that to whom much is given, much is expected. I was given much responsibility by Tiku Abubakar, and we will swim together. That's all. We can only swim together. We will not sink. This cannot sink us because we are men of capacity. We are people who have our businesses to run. We have our international contacts and connections. And we will continue to manage whatever God gives us. We are not desperate for anything. I respect him and I love him for that. And uh, whoever emerges as the winner, whether Atiku or B or Tinubu, I will be very happy uh, to say hello to them. That's all. Nothing personal. I'm not looking, I'm not desperate for anything, looking for appointments. Like some people will say, I cannot be this, I cannot be that. And then eventually people are lobbying for appointments. Anybody knows I support Buari. And after a few months, I saw he was losing direction. I apologize publicly to Nigerians. A desperate politician will always be in the ruling party. I've not been, in the last 24 years, I've been in opposition. And I'm very comfortable being in opposition because for me, politics is a part-time vocation. Mm. It's not full-time. How would you describe or what would you say to those who believe that uh, Peter will be leaving PDP was the greatest undoing for Atiku's ambition? It is not true. You if, think? If, you think if, if, I, I told you on your program before. Yeah. You see... At the University of Ife, I studied logic compulsorily in part one. So I still have my sense of logic intact. If anybody would have lost the election, it's not you are looking at party. You are not looking at the fact that the first condition of winning or failing is ethnicity. The second usually is religion. And the third factor, which is very, very major, is cash. In that case, Peter Obi would have chipped away from Ashwaju because Ashwaju was supposed to win at least two regions convincingly in the south. So with Peter Obi in the race, if Peter Obi takes out east and south south, that leaves Ashwaju with southwest, and even that southwest, Peter Obi contested it with him. So the logic people get confused easily in Nigeria when it comes to elections. The logic is not true that, oh, it took away from PDP. People during elections, I tell you, majority of voters don't belong to any party. They vote along ethnic and religious lines. Would you say this, you is, the most, would you say this is the most divided election in Nigeria's history? Oh, of course. Of course. It's not, well, I won't say in Nigerian history. I just gave you the example of a William of Onicha in 1979 and 1983. It's the same thing. The South East voted overwhelmingly for him, while the South West voted overwhelmingly for Aulaw. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. So, but Aulaw would have been president if Aulaw was going to win the entire North, which is impossible because people vote along ethnic lines. <laughs> That's why I'm telling you that if you already lose your base, it becomes very, very difficult for you to go and win elsewhere. So you don't win in Lagos. You don't win in Osho State. You don't win in South South. You don't win in South East. Suddenly you are a champion of the North. Based on what? And for a party, a useless party that was so useless that people were just waiting for Buhari to go. <laughs> so on what basis were people voting for APC? That is why some of us were in PDP in the first instance because APC had bungled it, had fumbled so much that people were tired. They just couldn't wait for the arrangement to end. And then you are now telling me suddenly people love them. The people love their oppressors, love those who put them in hunger, love those who could not contain security, insecurity in Nigeria, love those who were just wasting money. So frigate. In, in, in all its ramifications. So you want to tell me that Nigerians were so in our collective stupidity or wisdom. So we were so stupid, we decided that, oh, we will compensate a party that had impoverished the people. No. Hmm. There is nothing like that. 
So, I mean, no. so, if, if it, so there are those who also think that Atiku Abubakar was being promised and there are confidence that he has gotten from some elites, the Northern Oligarch, and some who are referred to as the owners of Nigeria, that he should not worry it was coming to him. Uh, don't you think, I mean, do you think that, that that could have an effect also in perhaps the confidence that he had, which was now being uh, toppled by the outcome of the election? No. You see, people will give you one million reasons why you won or you failed. I am telling you, a seasoned politician like Atiku never rested on his words. Atiku never believed in uh, someone helping him behind the scene. What Atiku was always asking for at every opportunity was a level playing field. If there had been a level playing field and there was no self-help anywhere, that would be power. This conversation will not be taking place now. I am telling you, hmm. at Tipu World, I could not even believe how he managed to do that level of work. And never, never, throughout our campaign, did he call anybody to say, uh, INEC, how do we reach out to INEC? Yeah, we need to go and do this. How do we reach out to the police? How do we reach out to the SS? How do we reach out to... That's not Atiku. Atiku is a Democrat. There is nobody who has his network in Nigeria. Nobody. Hmm. He, he's been in, in national politics all his life. Not, not even his the gener the generation. Not ge gener his generation or generation after him. No one has, I no one com comes to it. majority of the people with Atiku, including myself, we were much younger. And we were very close to the youth. And that's why I'm telling you that ethnicity played a factor, religion played a factor, money played a factor. In all three, there is none that we say Atiku lacked. So Atiku had, yeah. So well, if, if Peter will be at joint forces, with Atiku Abubakar, 11 states with the other state that Atiku got, do you think Paul Atinubu would have had a chance? You are making a mistake by thinking that if Peter Obi had joined Atiku, Peter Obi would have won those 11 states. Peter Obi won those states because if the people considered him fresh. He didn't win. Was he not running it to Atiku in 2019? So why didn't he win those 11 states? This is logic. It's simple. Lo I'm, I'm surprised that people just say, oh, it's because we can left. It, what did we can record in Rivers? What did Seyima Kide record in the in Oyo State for Tinubu? What did they record? What did Buruburu record in Enugu? What did the man in Abia, what did he record for Tinubu? Oh, if they had not left, maybe they would have won. People don't take time to do simple arithmetic, not even mathematics. Is, is it because we have this grand, grandiloquent idea of certain politicians, they are larger than, than life, they have too much money to distribute? No, it's beyond that. Someone went for the jugular of the election, and the jugular of the election is in it. That's where everything is scattered. A million Peter Obi could not have stopped it. A million weekends could not have stopped it. That thing. Impossible. <laughs> it was a done deal. Uh, I, I, but if you look at it, um, uh, Atiku, Atiku had 12 states, Tinubu had 12 states, um, uh, Peter Obi also. Uh, had, you are sure Atiku had 12 states? So, uh, apologies. I think. Uh, are you sure of that? My calculations are wrong. Apologies. I, I, I'll, get, uh, I'll get that correct <laughs> now. So, um, uh, well, please. You know, you know, in, apologies. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a, a very wrong statistic here. No, don't let Nigeria confuse you. <laughs> Just <calm> down. <laughs> Nigeria is a very complex uh, state. Yeah, <laughs> you can it easily is. get confused by it. But yeah, it I, is. I, I, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But, but the point I'm making is that. At the end of the day, you look at it, the article does not have the spread, uh, the 25% across uh, the two-third that is required by law. What do you have to say to, uh, to that, too? 
Uh, but yeah, I'm sure you are aware that Chiku claims 21 states, leading in 21 states. I'm sure you are aware of that. Yeah, in the court. Uh, and you are a lawyer in the making. I don't know if you have graduated now from the <laughs> law. <laughs> so you have to be very careful what you say as a lawyer. I can be excused as a layman. You know, um, my attitude to it is number one, nobody can persuade me. No people are using semantics now in Nigeria to confuse themselves, not me. 25% electricity is compulsory. So Neither Atiku nor Tinubu had 25%. So on that basis, it means that they fell short of the requirements. So you can see how objective I am now. Mm. I hope you are following me. Absolutely. Okay. So that, for me, is the first basis. The other are the issues that they've raised against Tinubu. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, so I'm not competent to speak about them. So... I believe that on the basis of that, the election is inconclusive. That is my belief. Hmm. And they should go for it. Long. If I'm a judge, that's the way I would look at it. That, okay, Peter will be at 25% in FCT. INEX is, if they don't have enough spread in uh, two thirds of 36 states, Tinubu did not have FCT, like my principal article. So that renders the whole thing inconclusive. And then the judgment should be clear on that. The other is to disqualify one of the candidates based on other, you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to be seen to be disparaging anyone. They are all my friends, all of them. Tinubu, Atiku, Peter Obi, Kwan Kwaso. They, they, I will be <laughs> together forever. So I don't want to disparage anybody, but I'm giving you the legal basis upon which the judges will now have to react to give their judgment. I was actually correct. All the three leading candidates had 12 states each. It was only Kwan Kwan so that had one. Um, uh, well, one, one, uh, 11 plus. If you say all the leading candidates had 12 each, but so plus the SCT. Is that enough to declare someone a winner? Mm. The spread in, in, in this you, sense. You are a lawyer. No, no, no. Legal you know, but, but you, you have to have a spread in, in starting in, in two thirds of the no, state. No, you the must first. have about 24 states to yourself. You are saying they led in 12, 12, 12. So did who had more states among them? The one 12 in each. The three of them shared 12, 12. The one in mm -hmm. 12 states each. Well, Concreto uh, add one, which is Kano State. But I mean, yes, and then and then you are looking at twenty five percent in about twenty four states. Absolutely, in, in absolutely. Yes, yeah. and you are looking at FCT, or you have an old FCT. No, out FCT, of the FCT is th th those who argue that FCT is in as a thirty seventh state in this kind of election. So there, there is no argument about it. If it was. Assume that you needed 25 states, the constitution would have been specific about it, that you need 25% in 25 states or 26 states or 27. They will not single out FCT. It's like someone saying that you should travel to a true state, but the road you must take must pass through Ibadan. And suddenly you said, no, you changed your mind. You went through Ijebote to arrive in Ibadan. No. The what you were told specifically was that you must pass through Ibadan. And there will be a reason why you were asked to pass through Ibadan. It is because Ibadan is so sacrosanct to your journey. Or there were things that you were supposed to do which is to reflect the you know, centrality of Abuja to all Nigerians. So, but suddenly, I have a master's degree in literature in English. And I believe I know sufficient English language and grammar for the constitution to have specifically requested for abuja you can say whatever if anything can be argued in court anyway you know lawyers you argue for both sides <laughs> even when it is obvious that one side is completely hopeless so that happens a lot in in our legal system but i'm not a lawyer i'm not a judge but i'm just saying that in this case 
Tinubu did not have 25 percent. Atiku did not have 25 percent in FCT. So there is a stalemate between those declared number one and number two. There is a stalemate, and only the law court can tackle that. The only person with 25 percent, and if Obi is able to prove that he won 25 percent in more states than both of them, then they will declare him winner. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as APC. The other hand, as APC, I am not the one that will determine that. Peter Obi, to me, is the only one who reflected the wishes of the constitution as per that. The only area he now has to add to it is that he had 25% in 24, 25 states. If he can't prove that, then it's a statement. And then it becomes either one of them is expelled or there is a rerun which more than likely will be between the declared number one and number two but i don't see any other option and i think i'm objective enough i'm not coming here now i'm not one of those people come here and he sees that uh, somebody must uh, must be declared winner declared winner on what basis if you follow through the prescribed requirements, it's as simple as that. Then that's all. I can't be the judge, but those are the that, those are the facts of the case that I have read, and I've read it thoroughly over and over again. Mm -hmm. Nobody can just wake up and say this is what will happen. Mm -hmm. The judges will have their basis for whatever judgment they arrive at. Mm. We, we, we'll leave the judges to it, and we are hoping that uh, uh, justice will be served. But let's look at is uh, Bola Tunubu is in president. Um, he's someone that you know very well. In the last few months of uh, being the saddle, what's your assessment of Bola Tunubu's presidency? Well, it is too early for me to assess him uh, very well. He has taken some steps that I liked. He has taken some steps that I believe he needs to be very cautious. Uh, so if I have an opportunity after the court cases to advise, I will write in pendulum. One of the reasons I have not been writing pendulum is that I don't want to prejudge anything. Uh, so when the court cases are done, I have my powerful back page of this day newspaper and he will read my opinion i don't have to see him physically before i write to him i wrote so many open letters to buhari and i'll be writing a lot of open letters to whoever is the winner at the end of the day whether atiku or somebody you say okay if atiku is in power uh, we'd like to be able to advise him and the only thing that stops you from writing is if it's your boss and you are working under him and like I said, I'm not seeking any position. So my belief is that Inubu has done some things that are very good. Um, I'm a very objective person. I will continue to harp on that. Uh, but there are some things like this the J Republic thing that he needs to thread softly. Uh, the subsidy thing, if I were in his shoes, I would not have declared on day one that I'm re uh, removing subsidy by fiat. I think that was dangerous. Uh, the poor people will continue to suffer because of that. If you drive around now, you'll see that there are fewer cars, much fewer cars on the streets. Uh, the poor are getting poorer. The market is almost virtually empty. Uh, I think you should have studied a while to study the situation more and to put palliatives in place you do not inflict injury on a man before you now start looking for your dying. What you do is, if you know that you want to heal a wound, you would have kept all your, you know, Panadol and everything, the painkillers in place. And then so that in case of any eventuality, now, if anybody drops dead, that person is gone because he doesn't even have money to go to hospital. He doesn't have money to eat good food. You know, I think... Uh, his advisors would need to act very 
fast. People will not tell you the truth when you are in power. But the truth is that I don't want Nigeria to fail. I don't care, like I said, who is in power. I don't want Nigeria to fail. And I will pray that whoever is there right now, whether we recognize him or we don't, we will not wish our country any bad thing. I will not. But do you think that Tunubu has what it takes to be a great president? Every leader has what it takes to be a great president if you listen to good advisors and if you have good advisors. If you don't have good advisors, you have, it's just like a journalist without correct sources. You will always carry fake news. I mean, I'm sure a lot of times, just now, I asked you a question. You had to quickly go and check it. and so, But if you didn't have reliable sources to give you the information, you, 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 you will not be able to speak authoritatively. For any leader to succeed, you must look at his team. Uh, the team that I'm seeing now, uh, I'm sorry, is, is even worse than Buhari's team. Really? I'm very sorry. The, the, the ministerial team, I mean, the likes uh, of uh, Nasir Arifai, Salam Lalong, Bos Dr. Bosun Tijani. Um, uh, I, I, will, I will not be specific about uh, names. Hmm. What I expected was a star-studded cabinet. I, 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 I like to regale myself with the sweet memory of President Ibrahim Babangida's cabinet in those days. We remember them to today. Most of the people appointed now are the journalists. Trust me, I don't know them. Under Abangida, I remember Chipad Exakinyele, I remember Professor Bolaji Akinyele, I remember Prince Bola Shodun, Bola Shodun, Ajibola, I remember Professor Yabore, I remember Taishola, I mean somewhere, I remember Walisho Inka, in FRIC, I remember so many of them with fond memories. You cannot say that today. A lot of the people, someone is appointed, if he's on their way to screening, you remove her. I mean, that's disgraceful. That shouldn't happen. So it means that you didn't do your due diligence before appointing people. And the people get appointed and they are shouting hallelujah and dancing. I mean, we are the, in the days of the Okojo Iwialas, the obvious Zekwe even the original Elu in those days, the new the bad Jews. I mean, everybody why, why, is so why you say Why you say the original Elu is it not the same Elu yeah, that is there now? that's the original. When he was original minister before this, now he's just coming back. I'm talking about the original, that moment, that golden his moment. First, his first time. Yes. You know, and uh, today, you just have what you call called Uwa Ogiriwa. It is unfair. Because if there is one person who knows a lot of technocrats in Nigeria very well, it's Tinubu. And that's why a lot of people supported him were saying that they were so sure he will replicate what he has done in Lagos. You know, it's been a star studded thing team in Lagos. You had Fashola, you had Ambote, now you have Jide Sonwolu. These are top notch technocrats. And that is the caliber that one would have expected in any government in Nigeria. Unfortunately, that's not what we are saying. So you are disappointed? Look, I don't want you to quote me out of context. I am not the type, anybody who knows me and knows the business I do, I don't practice negativity. And that's why I told you I will not mention any specific name. I'm just talking in general terms that this cabinet does not measure up to my expectation. When I... When you announce a football team, don't we all become, you know, uh, like uh, the football managers who we say that ah, uh, this team is uh, is weak. Uh, the striker, there are no strikers. Uh, the defense is loose. It's the same thing in government. What I see today is that this team is too loose to take Nigeria. Look, Nigeria. Parade some of the greatest human beings on earth. Nigeria has some of the best human beings anywhere you go, be it America, Australia, anywhere you go. Nigerians are brilliant human beings. I always talk about the southeast of Nigeria and how you can liken their praise to a combination of the Japanese, the Chinese, the Indian, the Koreans, 
You know, you have people there. Go to any part of Nigeria, you will find fantastic brains. How come you cannot bring them? It's the same old, old people we keep recycling. In which country do you do that? And you expect a change. Nobody cares in Britain who, where anybody comes from. You are good, you are good. That's all I'm interested in. So it, 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 I don't want yeah. to be mentioning yeah. that I'm disappointed. That's not the word that we use. I would just say that the, 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 the man in charge at the moment should have tried to investigate more. And I'm sure he knows what. He must have made promises to a lot of the godfathers in the different states who played one private role or the other for him. And that's the danger. This the is, more, danger this, this is more of a political compensation in your view. Yeah, it, it is. No, that is not in my view. It's a general view of the people. It's a compensation. And I tell people part of the reason that these things happen is all this fear of second term. My leaders are fond of pl plotting second term the moment they start their first term. If you don't care about your second term, you will do what is right. And if they remove you, you will be very, very happy that you have played your role very well. All is well that ends well, according to William Shakespeare. That is what I expect a leader to do. That look, whether I get the second term or not, this is my first term. I'm going to make it the best ever. And my name will be written in gold. So if you look at it, if there is one thing that you like to warn President Tinubu about, to be able to steer the affairs of this country well, what would that be? Ah, he should be, he should be aware of the people he surrounds himself with. Some of your closest friends are your, are your most wicked enemies. Trust me. I've been in this game for long. I've worked for powerful people in my life privately and i can tell you those who come to you every day and tell you lies about other people beware of them and there are plenty around they are there in abuja do you i mean we are hearing there are possible powerful people now in the corridors of power there was uh, for almost eight years we know that there were cabals in the presidential villa do you see a return of that scenario Every government has a cabal, whether you are Donald Trump in America. Or, so it's how you navigate and meander your way through that labyrinth of cabalism. You have to be very careful and be very watchful and be very prayerful. So whoever is there now, to please watch out. People are going to set you up for failure. And of course, after you've appointed your ministers, your SAs, your SSAs, and all of them, there will always be disgruntled people who felt, ah, ah, I supported you very well. Already there is crisis in the party that led to the exit of their national chairman, Adamu, and uh, my old schoolmate, Yola Omichore. You know, uh, it should reduce the number of disgruntled people around him. This is a free advice. Because they are the people who knew your secrets, who knew what you did, who knew about the campaign, who knew about the elections, who knew about everything you did. You have to manage them well, especially at this stage when the cases are still in court. Uh, just about uh, a few more questions. Uh, there are a lot of people here, Chief uh, Mamodu, that are willing to interact with you uh, before we wrap up. Uh, what is happening with the PDP? How difficult is this to org organize that party? It does look like after the election, there is really no way to galvanize the party. What is really going on? Uh, you see, don't forget that there are six cases in court. Uh, PDP is going through a natural phase, and you should expect that. There were many moles in PDP, and many moles still remain in PDP. What the PDP is doing is to be very careful. They know that when a bull enters your china shop, you have to be very careful in knowing how to get the bull out of the china shop. 
People say, oh, why don't you expel this? Why don't you expel that? They are just being careful, not that they are stupid. They are being careful. They are hoping that there will be a change of mind. But some people can never change their mind for as long as money is flowing from one direction. And there are people funding insurrection in PDP. It's normal. And then there are people who are still hopeful. You know, the federal government supposed the biggest largest in Nigeria. There will be ambassadors. There will be heads of our state house. There will be all kinds of appointments. And politicians majorly live on hope, especially those who have nothing to return to. They live on the hope that something will come. They've appointed some ministers now who will be promising them, don't worry, just let me settle down in my ministry, I'll take. So they live on hope and crumbs and all that. So a lot of people who are in PDP today are one leg in PDP and one leg in APC or wherever they will find comfort tomorrow. Some of them are also pretending to be playing along because they are not sure, hey, what if we say article will not come in and article comes in? Because article has a very good chance of coming in from the court cases and what they can see. I, I can feel that mood with the party. A lot of people believe that article stands a very good chance. So because of that, some of them who would have some assaulted into APC, they are keeping calm mm -hmm. and waiting for what will happen. Yeah. So... And the no. cleansing yeah. will be immediately after the judgment. Those who will move finally will move after the judgment, and those who will stay will stay. It appears some people were expecting the party to make a decision on expelling Governor Wiki. I don't know why a lot of people were expecting that. Each time the leaders of the party meet, they'll say, oh, they were not able to expel Wiki. How no, easy or difficult is it? To you. Yeah. Number one, Wiki does not just have money, he's ready to spend it. And politicians, I mean, and money, with all due respect to all of us, we're like sugar and soja hands. So everybody wants to make something. It's not easy. Politics is a very, very difficult vocation. So when you have a man who is ready to distribute his largesse, who is ready to spend any any amount to buy and call it favors and loyalty, most people are not going to go away. People will start going when it gets to that stage, they realize that it's not possible for WK to fund everybody. So right now, today, any meeting of PDP, you will find WK's guys comfortably seated. So what, the, what are you going to do? You're not going to beat them up. They were friends once upon a time. These are adults. So sometimes me too, I feel like that. Ah, how can somebody be obviously in another party and you're still putting his name in a, a team that will go and work in Bayemsa, go and work in a, a Cookie State? Do you understand? So it's it's too dangerous. Uh, it's too dangerous to say you want to expel a person like Wiki. It, I'm not saying to... it, there's nothing dangerous about it. If they decide to employ him to to sack him, nothing will happen. Because he I... will go to court. Hmm. Nothing will happen if they sack him. Nothing. It's just that you see, like I said, you have a gentleman like Atiku Abubakar. He's a perfect gentleman who does not retaliate. He's not a vindictive man. You know that some. Dictators who never allow. Let me try what he did in PDP. Let him try it in APC and see what will happen. That's why he's gentle. He, he, everybody knows their limit. He's gentle. He's, he's very meek these days because he knows that ah, <laughs> man pass man. Nobody has a monopoly of this thing. So the best thing PDP can do is what they are doing right now. They have to be careful not to cause more damage, more destruction until after the court case. I'm sure after the court case, everybody will decide where they want to go. Those who want to remain in the party will remain. Those who want to retire will retire. Those who want to join APC will join APC. Those who want to go to Labour Party will go. So, we're watching. <laughs> but, uh, my final question to you, Chief Dele Mahmoud, will be about the pain of Nigerians in the aftermath of the removal of subsidy on petrol and the policies of President Tinubu and the palliative, the nationwide broadcast. Let me get your view. That decision, the reaction of the president, and the further policy decision that have been made, 
how would you react to it? What's your assessment? What is your gauge? What is your uh, opinion about how those things have happened between May 29th and he made that statement and now? You see, I already answered that question and I would attempt to answer it again. That there are things you don't rush into, just like this Nikkei crisis. You need experts to sit down with you. You need to look at, for example, when we talk about subsidy in Nigeria, people get confused. Who were the beneficiaries? Oh, they will say it's a few rich people. But no, the poor people benefited by buying cheaper fuel. So how do you kill the few rich people and then kill all the poor people? So how do you maintain that balance? That is the crux of the matter. Yes, it is true that if your money was being paid, so why don't you block a lot of it anyway were over-exaggerated. Somebody supplies one million tons of petrol and then fills 10 million and the government pays. That's not the poor, the, uh, that's not the uh, fault of the poor man on the street. It is government that needs to straighten things out. That, for me, should have been the first job of government to make sure that you do a strict audit of the petroleum industry. The audit would have revealed that government was paying far much than was being supplied. But in killing a few big men, you now wiped out the poor. You can't cut your nose to spite your face. So that's my attitude to it as a leader. That look, you cannot, in the process of blocking a few, like you want to kill one or two rats in the village, then you set fire to the entire village. It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. So, uh, but before you go, because I am simultaneous on Instagram. Yeah and the Facebook as well. I just want to quickly Fantastic. respond to someone on Facebook. Please give me that permission. Okay. He said I was once Wiki's boy. I was never Wiki's boy. I was a consultant to Wiki. I rebranded Wiki. And you would have seen our pictures dressing well. I can post many of them tonight. Dressing well, looking well, looking happy being beside me. Even giving me his official car to drive, removing the flag from his official car. We can knew that I've been consulting for big people long before he joined politics. From age 30, 31, I was already consulting for MK Wabiola. Yes. So uh, you stop coming on social media thinking that everybody is at your level. A boy would not have walked away from all those dollars. A boy, if I was a boy, I would remain there. I know all the boys, big boys who have remained there. They can't go anywhere. But I have contentment. I have my business. I tell you, I love him. Good guy when it comes to project delivery. But when it comes to anger management, there is that. I'm unfortunate. So that's my response. Thank you, Shim right. for this Ch opportunity. Yeah, f fantastic. Uh, Chibdele Mamadou, what a moment. I mean, one, you can't believe we spent one hour. <laughs> It's amazing. We spent more than one hour. Absolutely, more than one hour, Jim. But look, there are a lot of people here. I will spend, uh, permit me, that, let's spend the next 10 minutes to. to <laughs> Jim, uh, please, please. Your Oliver Twist is asking for more. <laughs> please, Jim, <laughs> let, let's spend the no, next no. 10 minutes, please. I, I have no, a no, lot no. of people here who want to interact with you. Uh, and uh, no, I've no. seen a lot of hands there. Let me just take quite, uh, maybe a few, and I would like to. Uh, ask everyone who is going to come into the fray to uh make it very short precise and straight uh, to the to the point so that we can have, have as many people as possible before we allow uh chief uh, dilemma to go uh let me start with mazi Ndako. uh you are now with the mic go ahead please Good afternoon, Shemu, or good evening uh in Nigeria. Uh Chief Dela Mamodu. Good afternoon, sir. Good if you can sir. hear me. 
So, uh, when you say that uh, there are some policies from this Tinubu administration that is good, uh, I don't understand it because what I know about policies are uh, policies are meant to better the life of of the people, not to not to you know impoverish them, not to put them in more penury. So. I, I don't still understand when everybody come out to say, oh, these policies are good, they will be good in long term. I, I, I don't see it as a sensible talk. What do you think about it, sir? Right. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay, let me respond quickly. All right, great. I said, and I mean it, there is no government that is totally bad, even as useless as the Buhari government was. No government is totally bad. There were good things that they did. And I'm one of those who look out for good in people. Uh, so I'm not going to rubbish the Nubu because I'm not a supporter or anything. No. I will say the facts as they are. For example, the foreign exchange thing that used to benefit a few people. It will take time for it to get better. It is because we're not pumping money into production. We are pumping money into consumption. That is what is causing problems. So my advice to the government is that stop pumping money into consumption. For example, the profligacy ongoing in the National Assembly, if you cannot look at them straight in the face and tell them the truth that no Nigeria can no longer afford this profligacy, then there is a problem. That foreign exchange thing, trust me, is a good deal. I, where I have problems is using Godwin and Ifili as a scapegoat because we all knew what happened. There is a president in Africa who announced after he left power, he said, don't touch my guys. I gave them instructions on their decisions. If you want to touch anybody, please pick me up. I'll be willing to represent all of them in prison. That is what I expect government to know, that you don't make a scapegoat and very soon you make him a matire if care is not taken. And then if you have anything against him, take him to court quickly. You don't arrest people, then you begin investigation. No, you must have sufficient facts before you go and pick someone up. So the policy of removing that uh, exchange rate, uh, different exchange rate for different Nigerians, I'm happy that it is gone. That's one of the policies I was referring to when I said there are policies of Tinubu that I like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Delima. Let me quickly take another one. This one from Adebisi is at Ibirogba 2000 on Twitter. Yeah, you have the mic now. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Shemu, from here. I've listened carefully to the submission from the very beginning, and I, you guys have uh, tried to speak from your own different perspective. Anyway. I wanted to also let Chief understand that um, Mr. Atiku lost that election when Obi left. We have to just be factual about that. That it is the pure reality. However, Obi also went ahead to reverse politics. That reason he won Lagos. <laughs> because people were disgruntled because of the Muslim Muslim ticket. And you know, somehow Christianity is headquarters in Lagos, somehow, and all of that. So, and Obi had pandered to that. Uh, logic from that perspective, not for any other reasons, not because of any performance or anything, but we all know the, of those facts. So, however, however, uh, I wanted to also ask you, sir, that in all honesty, because if you had look, I don't know, maybe you have gone through the petition that uh, Atiku and Obi put forward. I'm just taking you back to all of this. I have gone through it, and I've just, and I've not seen where they have said that there was rigging. In, in those of those of their petitions, their petition were leaning towards more of uh, defamation of Mr. Uh, President uh, Ashwa, uh, President Bola Metinobu's character. Okay, he submit, he, he responded something. He did, they didn't, they didn't come forward with any allegations saying that he rigged the election. Maybe they also talked about the Abuja 25 percent and all of those. That then that's on the other side. Then I also uh, took some time to check out uh, Atiku's petition. He was also trying to claw back some vote from uh, from OB in the southeast because he felt that those are PDP stronghold. He should have gotten something out of those places. So I'm surprised at the kind of submission you are coming to put forward today, sir. Um, and I hope you will reconsider it. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, thank okay. you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So I will take this one is very easy for me to take. Okay, sir. Obi left article law. Obi was with article in 2019. Why did they win? I'd explain this. It's a simple thing. Obi was because Obi is now a man of his own and he was the fresh candidate. It's natural that we attract some attention. But Obi on his own could not do it. Do you understand? When he was with Atiku, they could not do it. So you cannot use Obi as a factor. Because if it was that simple, then they would have done it in 2019 when Wali Simpo had been at his lowest ebb. A lot of people didn't like Buhari in 2019. So you would have expected that a combination of Obi and, look, Nigerians don't vote like that. That's why I said number one consideration is ethnicity, number two is religion, number three is money. That's how it works, even in America. That's how it works. On the issue of, oh, they did not go to prove rigid. Everybody knows that if you go to court and say, I'm happy that you are a lawyer in the making. That if you go to court, the most that you would take the next two years trying to prove Ricky, bring in a uh, forensic expert, bring in, they were smart to go another route to save them time, save them resources. And why are you looking for the word Ricky when they said there were infractions? You did not transmit election results, you did not do this, you did that is enough to nullify the election. Coming to say you rigged me, uh, you reduced 20 votes from a limo show, you, you we need a tooth comb to search for those votes. The lawyers were smart at this time. Go and look at the caliber of lawyers in Nigeria today. I'm so proud of them. They knew all the tricks in the past. The when you go, you bring forensic effort. For the next six months, you are searching word for word, zone for zone, state for state. They went for the very obvious. You promised you were going to transmit election results. You transmitted national assembly results. So what happened to the presidential results? That is what they have done. They, don't, they didn't need to talk about rigging. The election itself was rigged once you refused to comply with the most important, and that's why it became the most expensive election in the history of Nigeria, because you promised you were going to transmit certain things, and you transmitted one, you didn't transmit the other. Is that not rigging or it? No matter the excuse you give, uh, there were glitches, there were, you can use any nomenclature you like. You already put some people at a disadvantage. Thank you. Uh, we will now read this process. I beg for 10 minutes from Chidele Momodu. So I, I'm not permitted to take more than one more I, I am ready. <laughs> I am comrade. ready. Where are your questions? <laughs> comrade, comrade Batticide at Polabi on um, on Twitter. Uh, it's your turn, please. Quickly, please shoot. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll be very quick. I, I think uh, uh, Chief Dele Momodu really... Uh, did brilliantly well today. Honestly, I, I couldn't agree more with most of his submission. And just uh, to quickly say, it's not correct that uh, the petitioners didn't talk about rigging. Uh, let's not forget that there are um, 18,088 polling unit results, blood polling unit results that INEC could not uh, provide uh, their own top copies. Okay, that said, my question actually is, is around um, uh, you know, a requirement for constitutional amendment uh, to ensure that tribunal outcomes are actually, you know, determined and, uh, you know, finalized, so, so to say, before the president is uh, sworn in. Because it is looking really, uh, you know, more difficult by the day when you have somebody who already appointed service chiefs is, is, is in control of, uh, you know, the police, the military, Ministers are currently being screened. So, you know, I mean, this is this this is looking more like an uphill task by the day when you really look at it that, look, you are going to uninstall so many things. So do you agree that we urgently need that kind of amendment to, just to ensure that, um, you know, um, this kind of thing doesn't happen? Because there's so much uncertainty that even if the court says, no, you are not qualified or this election was uh, nullified, 
you, you have already given this man a lot of uh, tools to, to fight back. Thank you. That's my take. Well, Chief, you, would you well, to, uh, uh, you see, I always tell people, I always use my doctor as an example. Whenever I go there and I say, check my blood pressure. And they say, oh, Chief, but you've never had a history of blood, uh, blood pressure. I say, no, it starts one day and it's good for you to know early. It's the same thing with this thing. Uh, people say, oh, they've never removed the president uh, who, who is already in power. There's always a first time. That's the whole idea of statistics. That the first time it happened was in 2023. The evidence will not fall. Look, that's part of this reason why people read election, because they know people will now bring all kinds of extraneous excuses. Oh, uh, look, we, it is too expensive. There is nothing more expensive than fraud. Quote me, there is nothing more expensive than fraud. If it is the people are able to prove that there was fraudulent malpractices in the election, so be it. No matter how, it, it is going to save us generations and generations of crisis and anarchy. Mm. The moment people lose faith in the electoral process, lose faith in the judiciary, our children may never recover again. And they will resort to anarchy. And you can't blame anybody for that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's the same thing. When Dino Melaye stood up that day and told the Akubu, say, oh, God, slow down. Let us show some of these infractions. He said, no. He said, they should go on. And after that, they can go to court. <laughs> they must put an end to that rascality. If you don't do that, trust me, in 2027, somebody is going to rig again and ask you to go to court. So the earlier you stop this go to court madness, the better. So the moment people see that they can no longer run to the judiciary to become governor that they didn't contest for, to become senator that they didn't contest for, to become president that was massively rigged, nobody will rig again. We must put an end to it. That's the whole idea. Thank you. <sighs> If I go on, we will not leave here. But let's leave it at that. I don't want to uh, take liberty for uh, what's it called now. Um, Chief Dele Mamadu, you've been magnanimous to be able to allow us to uh, encroach into your weekend. You should be resting and you allowed us to have this conversation. Many thanks for your thoughts tonight. Uh, what uh, a conversation it has been. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Dele Mamadu, for uh, your thoughts tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. I, I love to your family Thank and you. enjoy the rest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Thank you. post election debates are on ending, especially in this case where the matter is still in court. We can only keep our fingers crossed and our eyes on the judiciary. On the issues of governance, subsidy removal, ministerial appointments, ECOWAS decision on the JECU, are part of the decisions President Tinobu is being judged by. The aptness or otherwise of this decision may not be full blown yet, but the impacts are already uh, being felt. Also, uh, the caliber of people around the corridors of power is also a factor that may affect the success or failure of a government. There is beauty in diversity and so much strength in numbers. So, again, it is a reminder that as a country with such uh, a huge population, we need the best of us in position of power. And uh, that is perhaps not asking for too much anyways. Well, that's our show for today, everyone. Many thanks for joining on this week's edition of MyCon Podcast. I'll see you again next time. I'm Sean Wakimbalo. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Mike on Podcast with Shayono Kimbaloi. Mike on Podcast for the independent mind. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Mike on Podcast with Shayono Kimbaloi. Mike on Podcast for the independent mind.